Hi everybody, today I want to go to uh, the third function of management, okay. leading under our framework POLC. Okay, um, it's kind of sad we cannot meet face to face, and I miss you guys, I like the interaction. So, anyway, um, leading is really important in management. Okay, uh, of course every function is important. You know, the PLLC, right? The four functions of classical management we call here. Um, we have been spending time talking about planning, right? We talk about, talk about the process to come with a plan, a smart plan. And then last week we talked about six elements of organizing. So today I want to go to leading, okay? And then next week, I want to talk about controlling. And then I will give the final uh, personal project for you to interview a manager. Okay? And use the concepts. So, you know, by right now, planning is and decision making. I mean, Griffin called decision making is cornerstone planning, they always put together. So, basically, planning is about setting organizational goals. And organizers try to make sure all those activities, resources will support your original goal. And we are here today, so we talk about leading. Leading is to really talk about how to motivate people in your company. You know, assuming you're the future leader, right? Okay, we want to be leaders one way or another. Some going to be a parent, you need to motivate your children. Okay, and then next we're going to talk about controlling. Controlling and monitoring and readjust your original goal. Okay. And I know you guys love this book, right? Um, we spent a lot of time. You wrote three great essays here. And the goal by Gold Ryan and Cox. Okay. And you wrote, you know, the great essays there and learned so much from you guys from your reflection. And we've got two main characters, right? Alex. He's a guy who tried to save this plant, right? He's just three months away from bankruptcy. Uh, he got a, a boss pitch. Initially, he gets really bad, very rude. And, but as time goes on, and some of you actually reflected, you know, and he's getting nicer. So I was joking, he's getting more peachy, right? It's getting really nice, okay? So today we're gonna to kind of talk a little bit about it. Is Peach or Alex a really good leader or a good manager? Are they both? Okay. Of course, you know, I mean, I don't have the interaction here. Okay. So what does the leaders do? Okay. Then what does the manager do? Okay, some of you have some ideas, right? I mean, it's a lot of research, you know, on this area. What is a leader? What is a manager? What's the difference? Okay. I want to show you a classic one, and I want to make up my own comments. Okay. So, what does scholars and practitioners talk about the difference between a leader versus a manager? Okay. Seems a lot of times we prefer to, like, okay, I want to be a leader, not a manager. But I can tell you from somebody like me being in the corporate for almost 20 years, and I would say both are important. Okay. A manager is important, a leader is also important. Okay. Um, it's really, I like to say, the yin yang balance. Okay. So let's define that first, you know. So, what is the manager then? You know, probably you guys, okay, Alex is a really good manager, right? In the end, he did save the company. The company began to make profit, you know. His marriage was also saved, it became better, okay. But also, probably in the end, you also would agree with me, right? Peach is really been a good leader. Remember, he got promoted and he promoted Alex to his position, and he actually probably was a better leader than the manager, okay. Uh, so what does a manager exactly do? Or a manager's, you know, job, okay? 
Normally a manager is kind of rational. They make decisions based on data, you know, consulting, give you an advice, you know, but it's also persistent. You can see all those characters from Alex. He solved problems. He's a tough guy, you know, he's tough minded, right? The character, you know. Uh, he's also very analytical. He tried to get a lot of feedback from Jonah, you know, the consultant, right? I call him the first, you know, the consultant, kind of like a Jethro to Moses. But also the company is very structured. Everybody has a job to do, but always very deliberative. Okay, he has his purpose. Uh, he's very authoritative. Yeah, he's Alex, the team leader, and you know, I mean, probably see more that in Peach. Okay, but he's stabilizing. He said, okay, you know, um, come to my team, and we'll do this together. We'll save the company. And so basically, the one who centralizes knowledge means try to learn new things for the company. Try to make sure companies follow the the procedures, routines. Make sure things are done. Management's getting done, getting things done through people. Okay. So what is a leader then? Okay, we know a lot of great leaders in life, right? I mean, you probably heard about okay, um, Kennedy is a great leader. You know, some of you would agree. You know, um, I would say, you know, President Bush, the junior one after we got attacked by the terrorists. You know, and you know. He become a, a leader, you know, and some other great leaders, you know, President Reagan, you know, Prime Minister Thatcher, you know, so a lot of, you know, but also probably have some bad leaders, you know, like Castro, you know, and Saddam, it's bad leaders, anyway. But what does a leader do? A leader is really a visionary, okay, so basically the leaders can see much further, have a, a future plan. And leaders are very passionate. They're really enthusiastic about what they're doing. A leader is also very creative. They always have new ideas, you know. But a leader is also flexible. Sometimes they will kind of admit, okay, that's not really, you know, not gonna work, and I'm gonna change that. But also a leader is inspiring. You know, you inspire people into the future, to your vision. So that's really important, yeah. Inspiration, you know. Uh, we say Moses probably is a great leader, right? You know, we do Bible study, devotional study, and you know, I say try to charge Joshua, right? And, you know, so anyway, uh, of course, God is the ultimate strategist behind that. Anyway, so anyway, Moses is a great leader, but leader also need to be innovative. Okay, and we say this in business, right? You either innovate or you evaporate. Maybe we talk about big crisis right now, worldwide right now, because COVID-19, okay? Right now, the U.S. got six million people unemployed, and the economy just like, you know, cannot even go on, just pray, you know, things will get better, okay? So anyway, the leaders have to always think new ways. But a leader is very courageous. A leader cannot be coward. A leader have to take, you know, you know, initiatives. You know, gotta be brave like Moses. I mean, Joshua become a great leader too later on, right? Or Caleb, spirit of Caleb, right? But a leader also is the imaginative. You know, they always have ideas coming up, okay? As I said, I worked in the corporate before, you know, um, you know, I just made people some, I just always have new great ideas, new ways to make money, you know? And I can learn from those people. But also they like to try new things, exper experimental, okay? You know, and I would say, what's the damage? You know, let me try it. If fail, that fail. I try something else, right? So we learn from our mistakes, all right? Um, a leader is also very independent. Sometimes, you know, they're lonely, you know. Uh, Steve Jobs, right? I read books about him. Jeff Bezos, you know. He's a leader and studied seven books, you know. In Seattle, about 1990s. Now he's the richest guy, right? So anyway, so try things independent. But also the one actually who will share knowledge with others, okay? I mean, share the knowledge with the company, with the people, try to sell the vision, right? Okay, so anyway, so that's the kind of like differences between a manager and a leader. I would say managers try to really make sure the daily routines are done, you know, 
in a systematic way. The leader really tried to lead the company into a different future, different horizon. That's how I see the difference between a leader and manager. But I do believe you could be both. Okay, you know, um, it could be both, be a leader and a manager. Okay. Again, you know, there's some common ground between a manager and a leader. They both have to accomplish some goal, right? A manager makes sure things are done routinely, but a leader also wants to find a new platform, a new horizon for companies to be successful, right? And both have to explain the vision, the goal to the employees, okay? And they both, in a sense, representing the company, right? The figurehead we learned from Henry Minsberg's 10, you know, managerial roles. But also need to know how to motivate others. Okay, but again, they need to get resources to get things done. Okay, so there's a lot of great sayings about leadership and management. Okay, and I don't want to repeat those anyway. And the first one, really, uh, by Warren Bernice, is leaders are people who do the right things, managers are people who do the things right. Okay, all right. Okay, before we can lead people, we need to really understand the people, right? You know, as a manager, you need to understand your employee, right? I quoted Sun Tzu numerous times, right? Sun Tzu said, you know, know yourself, know your enemy, you're gonna win 100 battles, okay? If you're gonna be a good manager, you need to better know people under you, you know? You need to know their personality, the way, you know, they communicate, you know? Um, it's just so important to know the person, okay? Um, I have um, a good cartoon here. But also remember, you know, everybody has two sides. The good part, the bad part, you know, just like the moon, right? And you have the bright side and the dark side. So anyway, you know, Christians, we believe human nature is evil, right? We all have a dark side, okay? But, you know, we need to live according to the fruits of spirit, so we show up bright side, anyway. So it's important to know a person uh, from both sides, okay? And Peter Drucker, one of the most important American guru in management, really, he said things very important, you know, to actually talk about how to manage people. He said, only three things happen naturally in organizations. Friction, confusion, and underperformance. Everything else requires leadership, right? You want to be a leader, okay? You need to solve problems, the conflict everywhere. A lot of confusion. People don't know what to do something, they got lost. Just like the Israelites, right? In the wilderness, complaining to Moses, you know? You know, why are we here? We are better than in Egypt, you know? So anyway, but a lot of times people just get by, they don't do their best. So, for a leader, you know, a manager, you need leadership to make sure people are doing their job because they're paying them, right? Okay. I love this one, you know, I think we all agree as Christians, you know, Christ is a great, is the greatest leader. You know, he's a servant leader. You know, right now today it's actually Passover, you know, we've got a Holy Week, Holy Thursday. You know, um, Jesus said, John, 10, 27, he said, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me, okay? Of course, Jesus talked about disciples and his followers. But as a leader, we can learn from Christ, right? Okay, you know, we need to know our people. And when you know them, you care for them, they will listen to you. They will do things for you, okay? okay. So that's very important. Uh, another quote from the spiritual leader, Dalai Lama, that's the, the one, you know, the Bolivian reincarnation. Um, it's not the current one, 1391 to 1474. And 
he was saying, he said basically we are all the same human beings with the same potential to be a good human being or a bad human being. The important thing is to realize the positive side and try to increase that. Realize the negative side and try to reduce. And that's the way. So basically for a manager or leader, you need to really try to motivate your people's good side and try to find ways to minimize the other side, the laziness, the, the conflict in part, you know. And so anyway, so that's why it's important to understand both sides of your people. Okay. So then that brought us to this topic, right? You gotta understand individuals in your organization. Of course, we're talking about people who work for you, right? Okay. There's a very famous theory in organizations and actually come from psychology. I really call it psychological contract, you know. So what does that mean? You know, I have been a boss before and now I'm an employee. So I kind of understand that, you know. Um, so basically what that means is really for a boss to hire a person, okay, I work for George Fox, you know, and I have to contribute something to the organization, right? Because, you know, there's no such thing as free lunch, right? So I, I have to do my part. But then it's like, okay, if I do my part, the organization should find ways to make me motivated, give me incentives, and the scholars call it inducement. Yeah. So anyway, so basically this contract, you know, we talk about a contract, you know, contractual, right? You know. So basically says an individual must contribute and the organizations must provide. Okay. And it's kind of like this equal scale there, okay, between employer and the employee. Okay. Suppose employer, employee is here and they pay you much more than you contribute, and this is the employer, and then the company says, uh oh, this guy costs too much, you know. Um, we are not in a good position, so I have to get rid of this person, right? And that happens. Okay, some people get too expensive, go later. Anyway, yeah. But they also Sometimes, suppose you contribute like one million dollars a year, and the company pay you very little, you know, and and the, the market price should be like hundred thousand dollars a year, and you only make fifty. So, oh, where well, the company is not being fair with me, and you also decide to leave. Got it? So, it must be kind of equitable outcome overall. Of course, no perfect outcome. Okay, so it's very important. It's mutual, right? It's both. It's a free country. Nobody can force you to work for them. Okay. And you have a freedom to leave too. Okay. All right. So, what's in the psychological contract? Okay. You know, from the employee, from the individuals, you got to try your best, right? Your effort, right? Okay. If the company starts at 8 o'clock, you need to be there, right? Don't be late, right? And you work 8 hours a day, you know, at least 40 hours a week, but right? managers work 60 or 80. But you must have the certain ability, right? You must have the ability to perform your job. If you're a truck driver, you're not a dirty, you know, if a programmer, you're not a program engineer, you're not a maintenance, right? So anyway. But also you need to show loyalty, you know. It's important, you know, I've been for 10 years, you know, some of you like 20, 30 years. You kind of like show you love the place, and of course it's like, you know, um, must come from your heart naturally, right? But also you gotta have skills, okay? You know, for a professor, we have to have accreditation, right? I mean, I mean, we have all those certificates from undergraduate to master's degree to doctor degree, right? So anyway, but also need to spend time you know, just mention at least 40 hours a week, right? But we work more than that. And I was a VP for a company because I was working for like 80, 90 hours a week before anyway. When I was my own entrepreneur, I worked even harder, right? But again, you must have the competencies. You must be able to do a job, okay? All right? 
But then, for the company, first they have to pay you, right? There's no such thing as free lunch, you know? Must be a, a fair price in the market. And also, at least need to give you job security. You know, it's like, it's okay, a contract, you know, once a year, you know, a lot of companies just, you know, they don't have even contracts like that, right? But they also need to give you benefits, okay? How about healthcare? How about your retirement, right? Okay, so those are benefits, right? Okay. How about career opportunity? Means you can move up, right? You know, normally we started entry level. When I first finished my first job in college, you know, I was just a sales guy. I already had an MBA and then I got moved up to a system manager. And two years later, I became a manager. Another two years later, when the company got listed, and I became a vice president. So I got my career path, but also status, right? Sometimes people give you titles, you know. You know, I mean, for professors, you know, you know, you have your tenure track, and then you got assistant associate professor, right? So anyway, so those are very important. Okay. So again, think about the contract, right? Both try to be fair, okay? And so it's important to think that way, okay? The next one is really talk about, you know, sometimes we have somebody, and you know, I have many people over the years, also the people up over the years, and, and this person is really, really good in the interview, and like, after coming work for one month, like, oh my goodness, this person is not as good as I thought, okay? So basically, there is a poor fit between the person and the job, okay? A lot of times happens because we don't have all the information. You know, some people can perform really well in the interviews, but then reality is different. But also, sometimes, both people positions change, okay? You know, sometimes they feel like they're more valuable to the company, but you cannot pay them enough, so they just become like really disillusioned and say, you know, look for another job, right? But also sometimes, new technology, want new skills, and this person may be not willing to learn, okay? So yeah, again, this will happen, sometimes unfit will happen, okay, right? But then, again, we need to understand each person work for the company, you know? It's uh, just important to understand the individual differences. Just like Jesus said, you need to know your sheep. Jesus is a shepherd, right? But a good manager must know the people under you, Another way is to motivate them, to care for them, to show your concern. So anyway, so now I'm going to talk about personality, okay? Um, you know, we are all creating God's image. We have different personal traits, you know. And also our upbringing is different. But again, you know, one thing you need to give credit to business scholars. We try to learn all the things from different social science, including psychology. Okay, so we borrow the ocean, you know, personality, of course, as acronyms, right? From psychologists, and I talk to my psychology professors, oh, that's a bunch of baloney, actually, we don't really believe it. Again, you know, I mean, it's no harm really to find ways to know, know your people, right? So anyway, so basically, ocean, you know, is a personality trace from five major big categories done by psychologists, okay? And that distinguish, you know, us from each other. The O stands for openness, right? That's the O. C is conscientiousness. And the E is extroversion here. And the A is agreeableness. And the N is negative emotionality. So I'm gonna talk about this big five. It's common, you know, you know, people talk about it. So personality, okay? Okay, so the ocean traits. Again, the openness really is a person's rigidity of belief or range of interest, okay? Sometimes, you know, we are open to other people's ideas, some people are not, okay? Some people always say, okay, either my way, you know, and, you know, you know another way, you know? But again, some people are flexible, you know, change their views, you know, and again, cannot be that rigid in real business, right? Okay, we're not about moral principle, we're about like how you deal with people, you know. Uh, 
Some can be flexible with the time, with kind of food you want to eat anyway. So, all right. The second one is conscientiousness. Okay, um, it's a little bit different from our definition. Really means like the number of things a person can effectively work on at one time. Okay, it's not the more the better. Okay, I cannot teach all the subjects. You know, I teach management. I teach strategy, I teach global stuff, that's my area, right? I cannot teach accounting, you know, I cannot teach engineering, right? So anyway, so actually Griffin said in his text was really very interesting, I want to repeat that. He said people who focus on relatively a few tasks and projects are likely to be organized, systematic, careful, thorough, responsible, self-disciplined, it's the work to complete those tasks and projects, right? That's what conscientiousness. They're focused. They're systematic. They can meet the deadlines. They follow requirements. Okay, and some of you are right. So it's very important. Okay, that's very interesting. More conscientious people tend to be higher performers at workplaces. Okay, you gotta be that. Okay. The third one, called extroversion, a person's comfort level with relations. By now you know, right? I'm a, a super extrovert. Okay, and my wife joked about it. I can talk to a stone, you know? and I love people. I like interacting, and this online stuff is really kind of like boring. Okay, but there's no other way, right? Anyway, um, the next one is agreeableness. A person's ability to get along with others. That does not mean you have roots to your principles. Sometimes just kind of easygoing. Okay, uh, your friend said, hey, let's go for Thai food today. You say, okay, I thought about a McDonald's, but should I go to Thai food? You know, it's okay. Of course, we're talking about business, other decisions, just one of the examples, right? And the next one, and, oh, that's not a really good one. Okay, uh, what is really saying like negative emotionality, okay? So, some people are very negative, they just, so easily lose the tempo, you know. But here's how about like, okay, people, you know, who can control their negative emotion, they're more poised, calm, resilient, and secure. You know, you know, Mark Twain even said everybody, you know, has two sides like the moon, right? I mean, Dalai Lama said that too, you know. And the Bible talk about uh, living flesh and living spirit, right? So anyway, so I would say. You know, actually, there's a lot of EQ involved if you think about all the things. Okay. Again, this is ocean trades from psychologists, anyway. So I don't want to report, repeat this. But remember, you know, it's not always like on the left side is better or on the right side is bad. It really depends. Okay. There should be no value judgment there. Sometimes it's okay not to be that open, right? If your competitor wants to know your market information, you say, okay, you don't want to tell about your, you know, your, your secrets to the others, right? So anyway, it's not always like, you know, which way is better, got it? It's really in your balance, it all depends, right? We talk about contingent theory in management, okay? okay? And the next one about personality, you heard about MBI, okay? I think, you know, Fox, we do do the personality traits and strengths finders, right? So anyway, uh, MBTI is very common. I did mine too many years ago, but again, it's kind of also based on the personality types. They have more than five, you know, it's different ones. They have kind of like eight of them here, but again, you know, just take this with, you know, some discretion and first, you know, I believe human beings change and we could be both, right? Sometimes, you know, I could be an introvert too, it depends on the situation, I'm a super extrovert. Anyway, so um, there are different definitions for sensing, intuition. Let's go to the next slide. So anyway, I don't want to repeat this here. Again, I want you to, to, to think about things that could change. And actually, I can tell you mostly where I'm standing. I'm definitely extroversion, right? You can, you can tell, you know? Okay. Um, so that means like, you know, 
I very talkative, outgoing, like to be a fast-paced environment, tend to work out ideas with others, think out loud, enjoy being the center of the attention. Okay. And the next one, you know, over here. Okay. Number two is here, like sensing or intuition. How do you prefer to take information? Okay. If you focus on reality of how things are, pay attention to concrete facts, prefer ideas that have practical applications, like to describe things in a specific literary way, okay, that's sensing. If you are more into imagination, see the more big picture, and then more you are under intuition. And I think I probably like here, sensing. Go to the third one, is talking about how do you prefer to make decisions. Okay, if you are making decisions in an impersonal way, using logic, reasoning, value, justice, fairness, enjoy finding flaws in our argument, could be described as reasonable level I think I'm mostly here. Okay, T, I'm thinking, but sometimes I could be feeling too, right? Mostly. Number four, how do you prefer to live your outer life? If you prefer to have matters set up, think rules and deadlines should be respected, prefer to have detailed step-by-step -step instructions, make plans, want to know what you have getting into, then you prefer judging. So actually, I'm the chair, I'm not perceiving. Perceiving is just opposite. You prefer to leave things up to small open, okay, uh, more like improvising anyway. So right now you can see, right, I'm E-S-T-J, okay, and that's right here, E-S-T-J, okay. So what do the E-S-T-J people do? This says, E-S-T-J is a garden, gardening all the executive, okay. Yeah, I did have my own company for many years, right? Okay. But I also could be the ESFJ. You know, it really depends. I could be a caregiver or the counsel, right? So anyway, but again, you know, just treat it, you know, I mean, not, not as a joke, but again, you know, things change, okay? Yeah, with a little bit of skepticism, all right? Okay, so personalities are important for us to understand our way employees, okay? But also other personalities, you know, people show this at workplace. Again, you're the manager, you want to know your people, okay? And the book talks about six of them, okay? Locus of control, self-efficacy, authoritarianism, Machiavellianism, okay? That's a hard word to pronounce. Self-esteem and risk pros pro propensity. And we're going to talk about every one of them, again, it's kind of important to know this kind of personalities could, you know, occur in your employees or even your bosses, right? Okay. So the first one is really locus of control. Okay. So basically, it's your belief who has the final control in your life. Okay. You know, between you and the environment, who is the boss? Okay. Is the environment control you, or you can control the environment? Okay. So if you believe you are in control of your life, then you have the inner locus of control. And I believe I belong to there because I always say, with God's help, I can do it. And actually, Philippians four thirteen talk about I can do all things with Christ through Christ who strengthens me, right? Anyway, so, an actual American culture is more like we believe we can be the master of the environment rather than a slave. But some culture believe like, okay, we cannot do too much with the environment. We just become a slave to the environment. We cannot really change, you know, it's like, it's fate, everything's preset, you know, it's like doomed, so anyway. So again, you know, People have personalities like that. Okay, I have friends in China, they believe that the whole 
life is controlled by the Chinese zodiac, or some people believe in horoscope, you know, right? But that's their belief. That's more like external locus of control. Okay. The next one is self-efficacy. Okay. It's really like this confidence belief you can do the job. And actually, this is really important in life. Okay. High self-efficacy individuals believe they can perform well, while low efficacy individuals doubt their ability to perform. Okay. But I can tell you, you know, I have students just like, you need to kind of like guide them. You can do it. So are you sure? I say, yes, you can, right? Because those actually can be um, learned to be improved, you know. Nobody's born with high self-efficacy, right? Okay. Authoritarianism, uh, authoritarianism really said some people just like to make decisions, you know, very authoritative way, and some people like a dictator, doesn't know when to consult people. Anyway, a very hierarchical manner. Okay, um, probably you see this in the high power distance countries, okay, or family businesses, right? You know, okay. Um, the next one is Machiavellianism, and you know, it's actually from the famous, you know, book called The Prince, written by Machiavelli, and talk about this prince and basically where step on other people's, you know, back, you know, say bad things, get up, you know, means, uh, ends justify means. Anyway, so it's not really a good time because say, you know, the evil leaders in that way, you know, but you see that in real life sometimes too, just really be careful, okay? They want to power and control others, you know. It's not a good, it's like, not a good leadership type, and, you know, Say under the toxic leadership, or you know, so anyway, um, okay. Another one self esteem again, a person believes she or he is worthy individual. Remember the difference between self efficacy, ethics believes you can do the job. He is like, Am I worthy? Okay, and as Christians, I believe we are all worthy, right? We are made the image of God, you know. Um, but it's a lot of people, you know, I mean, my, my daughter works as a mentor. A social worker and you know some are really mental sickness is uh, people struggling with self-esteem so um, so anyway it's, uh, it's just uh, a very tough situation sometimes but again you know it could be a personality too uh, but again you know this can be improved yeah the next one is really talk about risk propensity you know this says like some people are actually willing to take the risk Maybe I'm one of them. So yeah, okay. I was born in mainland China, you know. I mean, I'm from my really from my farm. I never thought, you know, I would make the decision to come to the U.S. Right? That's a big bold, you know, move, right? So I'm a risk taker. But I also started my own business. Okay, I, I didn't have much money and only twenty thousand dollars, but our business was for ten years. You know, we made very good money and by God's grace. So you see that, right? But I have some people, even like my siblings, you know, like, okay, do you want to go to the U.S.? No, 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 no. I like China much better. And I say, you know, again, you know, even my siblings, some of them not risk taking, right? So anyway, really, so then in a company, if you have people who are more willing to take the risk, maybe, you know, send them to uh, start a new business, a new product, right? For those people who are not going to take risks, maybe just uh, um, make sure they follow the procedure, make sure quality insurance, quality control, go. anyway. So the point is really try to use everybody's strength, okay. okay. The next one we'll talk about really um, just, I cannot emphasize more on this, emotional intelligence. Uh, you can watch the video, you know, I say this all the time, as a father of four daughters, really, you know, uh, it's just important to have good EQ. The reason is because, okay, I would say everybody have similar IQ, intellectual intelligence, but what's to make a big difference in our life is really EQ, it's emotional intelligence, okay? And I always like to say, you know, you get hired because of your IQ, because you get a degree, and, and you know, and you performed okay, your interviews are hired you, but then, 
you get promoted because of your emotional intelligence, because you're a good leader, you care for others, you, you know how to solve problems, and you can lead. And so those uh, actually come from the emotional intelligence. Remember talk about emotions, okay? There's a lot of theory on this, but I like Daniel, Daniel Goldman's theory in a simple way. You know, five things, actually, I use acronym you have to remember, right? Same, okay? Of course, the S is like, you know, I put like social skill, right? You know, social skill is very important in life, right? Social capital. You know, as a business person, you know people, you know. Um, we say this in business all the time. It's not what you know, it's who you know, you know. But again, talk about like how you relate to others, okay? And A actually here like self-awareness. Means know your strengths, also know your weakness. We can do SWOT analysis on ourselves. Okay. And then the first one is really very important: how to manage our emotions. Okay. Um, the Bible talks a lot about you know, wrath, anger is not good. A fool, you know, will lose the temper, right? So anyway, it's so important. You know, uh, it's you know we all struggle sometimes. But to manage our emotions, uh, especially negative emotions, is very important. You know, you don't want to get mad at everybody, you know, and you know, just like become emotional. And, you know, again, it's a learning process anyway. So that's very important. Because if you cannot manage your emotions where well, you could destroy, your, destroy yourself as well, also others, right? You say bad things and run things. It's just, it just really, really bad, okay? The next thing you have to motivate yourself, okay? That's more than just self-esteem, right? Uh, Self-efficacy, you know? And, you know, I'm 55 and I always say like, you know, by God's grace, I'm here today, you know? And, you know, nobody said I need to go to college, get a master's degree, or come to US or get a doctor or start a business. But the thing is always, I believe like, God, give me the talent, I don't want to waste it. I will push myself, yeah. So anyway, so it's very important to motivate oneself. Self-motivation is very important, okay. And the last one, the E here is really empathy, you know. Um, we're not talking about things, empathy, empathetic. Put yourself in that other person's shoes, you know. Actually, I, I read um, a very good devotional story uh, quite a few years ago. I, the story of saying like, our Lord Jesus actually is the greatest empathizer. Remember, he loved us so much. And he knows we are so prone to sin. And God sent him to come to this earth to die for us on the cross. In a terrible death, right? You know, today like Passover and the Easter is coming. Anyway, so, and Christ is the greatest empathizer. Because he loved us so much, right? John three sixteen. Anyway, but again, you know, so those five things under emotional intelligence, okay? Um, again, a lot of theory. It's really talking about how to manage yourself and how do you manage your relationship with others, okay? You gotta practice it. You can just learn this from textbook, right? Yeah, you learn by making mistakes, okay? Yeah. So again, as I said earlier, you get hired because of your IQ, you get promoted because of your EQ, remember that. EQ is more important than IQ. Okay. Alright, so anyway, a lot of great quotes from Daniel Norman and from others. Okay. But the next one we'll talk about, you know, individual behaviors, remember attitudes and behaviors, right? And I think you heard many times you said attitude is very important, right? Because it's saying like attitudes determines latitude, means how far you can go. Okay. All right. Okay. So what is attitude then? You know, in the management sector or even psychology, you know, the reason because when you talk about attitude is like you need to understand your people, you know, how how they, how they view things. Okay. So it's really complex of beliefs, feelings that people have about specific ideas, situations, or other people. Because you try to find ways to work with everybody. If you have a great idea, what do you think? You know, what is this about, okay? So the attitude has three main components here, okay? Effective, 
component means like emotions are involved. And the cognitive component is like goes through our brains, our thinking, learning process. And the intentional component is really like you decide what to do. Okay. I have a great example. I don't want to repeat this. You can read this. Uh, it's a really good example. I wish you know you guys uh, uh, in person we can talk about it anyway. Um, yeah, it's personal experience here. Okay. All right. But then sometimes we find people is not doing what they're saying. Okay. We call this cognitive dissonance. Okay. Um, that means really they're struggling with their attitudes. Um, this says the effective and cognitive components of the individual's attitude are in conflict with uh, intended behavior. Let me give one example, you know. When I was working as a VP in the company and, you know, I had my own office and secretary, I was like, wow, what a good life, you know. And, and we sell a lot of computers to the small business owners. And I thought like, okay, you know, I don't want to be in that kind of business. And like, you know, a few years later, I was in that position. I become an entrepreneur, study with, you know, me and how my wife, and then we have like, peak time we have like 12 to 14 people. So you see that, right? I never thought I want to be an entrepreneur, and then I did. So I went through that process, cognitive dissonance. It's okay. How about other work-related attitudes, you know? Because attitude can change a person's views toward work. Are they satisfied? Are they happy? The reason is because if we are happy in this workplace, and then you're gonna do your best. Um, I'm doing some research with my Chinese friend, uh, James, and he was a business scholar here before, and we actually, um, study the employees' well-being, okay, and try to dig the issues behind what makes the Chinese workers happy. You know, it's different from American workers. American workers want past performance, and Chinese emphasis more like relationship, their colleagues. You know, you have heard the people saying, no, "I don't like my job, I like my colleagues." Anyway, it's very interesting. Anyway. So the important thing is like. If the employee is satisfied, they will do a better job, okay? If they're not satisfied, they will not do a good job, right? So anyway, so organizational commitment is also very important. Remember, we talk about the psychological contract, you know, the loyalty, commitment, right? This company want to keep good people, you know? Yeah. Um, over the years, I hired many people also, sacked quite a few too, you know? You know if you're a good one, they want to be there for a long time, and, you know, Right? If they're bad, you know, you cannot stay for too long, right? So anyway, so again, commitment is very important, you know. Um, committed people can also do better jobs in real life, okay? Okay. And then the next one is really positive effectivity. I think under Oshin, under the strategy, you know, under personality, we talk about uh, negativity, emotionality, right? Yeah. But in real life, you know, you also see people, some are really positive. Um, when we have water here, you know, and some people say, oh, that's, bottle is half full, you know. That's the positive effectivity people. And some people say, no, 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 it's half empty, okay. And for me, it's like, always like to see the positive side, okay. Because that's change your attitude, okay. You know, people or some people always whining, whining about this, whining about that, right? Okay, that means they're really negative, all right? So, again, people can change, okay? So, again, if you're a good manager, try to find ways to improve this person. Anyway, I'm not saying, you know, managers could be some negative too, anyway, but just important to understand those uh, personalities, okay? But also about perception, you know, we talk about attitudes. How does perception change? individuals, okay? So perception is really individuals become aware of or interpret information, you know? It's like perceived, it's not real reality, it's how I see things, okay? But again, as a manager, it's very important to understand your employees' perceptions, okay? I mean, you heard this before, right? A lot of times we have selective perceptions. If a boss likes to see employee, you know? just like kind of ignore the negative things you know 
Yeah, and that's not good, right? Because ideally we should, you know, have the holistic picture. But if a boss dislikes a person, if this person does a great job and is like, yeah, 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 that's still not good enough, right? So anyway, so selective perception is not good in a sense, right? Okay. So again, we should have holistic approach. Okay. But a lot of times, like we all have problems, so you know we have stereotyping, you know, and categorizing and labeling the basis of a single attribute. Sometimes we judge one person for the whole race. That's wrong, right? That's racism anyway, and that's why you know we should not have a stereotype, right? Um, so anyway, so it's really important, you know. Again, we are all different. We are all unique. A stereotyping is really wrong, and that could even end up to uh, breaking the law, right? So anyway, so it will cost organizations a lot of money. So anyway, so that's got to be really careful with those bad, bad uh, percep perceptions, okay? Okay, but perception is also closely linked with attribution. Okay, you know, what is attribution management? What should we know? Attributions really talk about a mechanism through which we observe behavior and attribute a cause to. Okay, you know, like I mentioned earlier, right? When the boss is just like, okay, overlook at the person's negative side, and, you know, just only emphasize the positive side on the person, and that's probably a wrong attribution, right? So anyway, so basically, they have three components with this: consensus, consistency, and distinctiveness. Anyway. Um, again, I have a good example here. I don't want to explain every one of them. Um, I want to read the textbook. Really, uh, Griffin had a very good um, example there. Okay, uh, actually, this one's from the textbook. So you talk about like a person working in the few hours, then before you know, like you're the boss, you notice some change in this person's behavior. And right now, talks less about the job. Okay, and it costs sick more often right now. And then you're the boss, you say, oh yeah, she's not as enthusiastic as before, and decides to quit. And you say, uh huh, okay. You observe the behavior, and that's an example from the textbook anyway. Yeah, attribute across to develop a consistent response anyway. So that's an example of attribution. Okay. It's another concept. Perception, attribution, it's all kind of related to attitudes too. It's important for many to understand, okay. The last one we're talking about really stress and the behavior, okay. I guess we're all stressed right now, right? I'm gonna be stressed teaching online, you know, I mean, I like people, you know. I'm stressed with, you know, staying home, you know, and have to deal with my four daughters, right? It's stressed with grocery shopping, I have to wear my mask, right, anyway. A lot of stress from work, right? Anyway, okay, so stress is natural, we are human beings. It's really our response to a strong stimulus, a stressor, right? I mean, we gotta be stressed right now. I mean, COVID-19, you know, and kill so many people, just so sad, you know, I pray every day, Lord, you know, just stop this plague, right? So anyway, a lot of people, you know, go through a problem right now, and it's kind of ironic. Um, you know, drugs, consumption much higher right now for the last two months. Anyway, it's really that's some people find, you know, release from that stress or probably. Yeah. Uh, you know, a lot of theory on this, but the theory from textbook talk about general adaptation syndrome, uh, talk about the stress process. The first one really if you're alarmed and then you resist and in the end you get exhausted. So anyway. So again, as a manager, if you find your staff is stressed, then you need to understand the process. Find ways to de-stress them. Find the ways to help them to be more relaxed or to deal with those issues, right? So that's what we talk about in this class. But personal is also very important, right? So anyway. But some people say, okay, personality types also determines stress level. And type A or type B, you know, some people say, okay, type A person, a very aggressive, competitive, devoted to work, have strong sense of time and urgency, become impatient, a lot of drive and wants to accomplish, you know, I'm type A, 
है टाइप बी लेस कंपेटिटिव लेस डिवर्टेड टू वर्क लेस लाइफ एक्सपीरियंस पर्सनल स्ट्रेस एंड मोर लाइक बैलेंस बट अगेन आई वुड से इज नॉट ऑलवेज ट्रू यू नो we could be both you know sometimes you know the type of type b right again really depends our our maturity you know and i believe as christians we can pray and god can help us to grow in the fruit of the spirit right so sometimes when we act in a flesh way and you know and we could be very bad so anyway But again, I don't think personality determines a person's future. Okay. Okay. But also, a lot of times in the workplace is really past demands, right? Get the job done by this time, and company like do more with less. Some physical demands. Okay. Some temperature, and you have to carry away. And for professors, it's like we have read so many papers, right? You know, we don't want to keep the answer too long. You know, for me, it's like I always try to give you the fact you got like, you know, less than three weeks. You know, I have hundreds of students, right? So anyway, but sometimes like you get stressed because of role demands. Sometimes your boss gives you something is not clear what you're supposed to do, and sometimes conflict too. But sometimes a lot of interpersonal issues, and personality clashes, and you get some leaders are very, you know, authoritative and not caring. And sometimes you get your team members not willing to do the job and freeloaders anyway. So there's many reasons to cause organizational stress. Okay. So what are the consequences, right? You know, could be behavior. People act weird. Could be psychological, mental sickness, medical. Could be hypertension, right? Anyway. So basically relates to lower productivity, lower morale, and people withdrew from. You know, work, they get different and they just cause sick anyway, and they get burned out. You know, and it happens in your real life too, right? And actually, companies every year lose billions of dollars productivity because workers are stressed and burned out anyway. How do we manage stress? Okay, a lot of you know how, right? Anyway, I would say regular exercise, right? I get a fit feet and try to walk like ten thousand steps a day. If I don't walk, I just feel like oh my body's, you know, the blood is not circulating, right? Also relaxing, listen to good music. I like to take photos, you know, love in walking my neighborhood. I love nature. I cannot see those beautiful trees. I mean Hong Kong, Hong Kong is like New York, right? But also better time management. You have a deadline and try to plan ahead of that. You know, I got a lot of students just last minute. You know, give submit the paper. You know, and then actually you get one month between, right? That's bad management. And the next one, we have support groups. You know, we need friends. We're not made alone, right? Okay. So have some good friends, soulmates you can talk to. And after all, right? We have a great God we can pray to, right? Pray to God every day. I love Christian music and also nature music to retire, re relax anyway. So a lot of things you could do. Okay, um, as I mentioned, you know, as a Christian, um, go to Matthew eleven twenty eight. You know, and Jesus said, "Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn, and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light." So anyway, we can always pray to God. We can cry to God, right? So anyway, so that's very important here. Yeah. Um, just so important to trust the Lord, okay? And the very last one, this is Isaiah forty thirty one, my favorite Bible verses. Isaiah saying, "Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary." Will walk and not be faint. Okay. So today, this is what I want to talk about. So basically, we are in the third element or function of 
management, we talk about leading. Before we talk about motivating, the next chapter, leading, we talk about leading, we need to understand the individual behaviors in the organization. So we talk about personality, the ocean, the big five, then we also talk about other personalities, then we talk about attitudes, perceptions, attributes, and then we talk about stress, or how to handle stress, right? So anyway, so basically that's what I want to talk about today. I want to read the chapter, and next week I want to really go to the motivational part. Uh, we're gonna talk about the content, what makes people motivated, or the process, how people are motivated, and then the R is really the reinforcement. Okay, so high fake good, stay at home, stay safe, stay home, stay healthy. Okay, bye-bye.